to bring it to your attention one more time, the Christmas party date we had had uh, set up for the 27th got a resounding no. So, so if you have a date before Christmas that uh, you would like to see it on, you can let me know and I'll try to make make that happen. All right, but we are definitely going to still have it. I was looking through my photos. Um, I'm doing a service for Texie Hill Saturday. We used to used to attend here, <clears throat> and um, I was looking through the pictures of the old church back 20 something years ago, and before the building was here and stuff. We used to meet in a little one room building. The bathrooms were up here. People used to walk up to go to the bathroom during the sermons. Um, but Texie was a member of the church back then, and we had a, a little picture of everybody standing right out here in the parking lot. There used to be a house there, a preacher's house. I, don't, I never lived in it. But, um, but anyway, I was looking at it, and I saw some of the early pictures of our Christmas parties. And uh, a lot of fun. A lot of good memories, all the, the fun things that we did. We used to do the game of uh, trading gifts. What, what was that called? Gift exchange. Gift exchange. Yeah, but uh, people used to buy these gag gifts all the time. And it, it was just hilarious. We would have such a good time together. So uh, hope that you'll be planning for that. And also, uh, Orphan Sunday. Um, November 12th, and I hope that you're thinking about that and really wanting to participate in that. I'm going to be leaving the 23rd of this month and going up to Eureka, California to preach at a church up there that heard about what we've been doing with Orphan Sunday and want to be a part of it. So please pray for that to go well and that we can get their involvement in that as well. Um, this little church has been giving close to $100,000 every year toward the many different organizations um, that really have come to depend on us. So I'm really praying that we will come through for them again. So be praying about that. Be planning to make sacrifices and be generous. And uh, let's... let's uh, Bless, bless the Lord's work in that way. All right, if you open your bulletin, you can see there's a sermon outline inside. I always encourage you to take notes, and that way you can look at it during the week and pray about some of these things. We've been doing this series on putting on the Christian garment, and this metaphor is used over and over, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, this idea of putting on and putting off and clothing yourselves. And it's, it's a metaphor of transformation. It's the idea that you, you come in from a hard day's work, you're all sweaty and stinky and your clothes are all stained up and you go in and you take your clothes off and you throw them in the dirty clothes hamper and you go take a shower, you come out, walk over to your closet, your wardrobe, you look at it, and you pick out a nice, clean, fresh outfit for what you're going to be doing. And that's kind of like what the Christian life is. You know, you, you, you come into this relationship with God, a dirty, stained, stinky sinner, and you make a, a decision that you're, you're not going to continue in that life anymore, and so you put off your old self, and you, you go here and you take a bath in the baptistry. Not really, but you know what I'm saying. Uh, in fact, Ananias told Saul of Tarsus, Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. But the idea is that we, we, make, we make a decision to give our lives to Christ and let him change us from the inside out. And so we've been looking at several of these metaphors in the New Testament. And we started with just clothing yourselves with Christ. 
clothing yourselves with Christ and what that means to, to really let Jesus be Lord of your life, to come into your heart and reign and rule that God's will be done in your life as it's done in heaven. And, and praying about that all the time, Lord, clothe me, clothe me with righteousness, clothe me with compassion and kindness and goodness and forgiveness and mercy and, and all these things. And, and the Bible really stresses this idea of putting on these things in your life, putting on these garments of virtue and character. And that's what God looks at. He doesn't, he doesn't judge us just on our, our behavior. He, he judges us on our hearts. I mean, the whole ministry of Jesus was letting people know that, that God is more concerned about your heart than he is about your outward deeds. You can, you can pretend to be righteous. You can look beautiful on the outside and be full of dead men's bones on the inside what Jesus called the Pharisees. You're like whitewashed tombs. Beautiful on the outside, full of dead men's bones on the inside. And so these are things that we should discipline ourselves to let the Spirit of God transform us from the inside out. And this morning I want to look at this passage in 1 Peter chapter 5. Really, the verse we're looking at this morning is in verse 6, and it says, uh, young men, in the same way, be submissive to those who are older. All of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. And then he goes on from there. But this whole concept of clothing yourself with humility, and he's writing to the church, Right? He's writing to this church of Jewish Christians who had been displaced by persecution and were living in Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey. And they were being persecuted, and they were suffering greatly, and he was writing to them to encourage them to not give up, to, to remain faithful to the Lord, to, to just work together to help each other stay faithful to God. And so Peter writes to them and he, he starts addressing the elders of the church. He says, to the elders among you, I appeal to you as a fellow elder, a witness of Christ's sufferings and one who also share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, serving as overseers, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not as greedy for money, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when Christ, the chief shepherd, appears, you also will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. Young men, in the same way, be submissive to the elders. All of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your cares on him because he cares for you. I want you to notice how he first comes to present himself to them as a fellow elder. He's saying, I'm just like you. I, I'm, I'm just one of you. I know what you're going through. I fully understand your suffering. I personally have gone through that myself. And I want to encourage you. This was Peter, one who learned true humility from Jesus. And when you go back and you read the Gospels, you see Peter being humiliated time and time again. When he, when he you know, pipes up and acts so bold and aggressive and everything, and Jesus has to say, well, just calm down there, Peter. 
you're not there yet. How Peter had, had, you know, he had been with Jesus the whole time. Jesus had entrusted the keys of the kingdom to Peter. That was when Jesus asked the disciples, who do men say that I am? And they said, well, well, some think you're Elijah or Jeremiah or one of the prophets and John the Baptist. Well, who do you say I am? You're the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus said, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. And I give you the keys of the kingdom that whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Peter was the one who Jesus would later tell three times. You really love me. Take care of my flock. Remember these stories? When you, when you think about Peter's life, you think about that young disciple who was always saying things where he should have just kept his mouth shut and and Jesus would just gently instruct him, and, and then they would move on, and, and Peter would do it again. You remember the transfiguration? Peter's like, isn't it good that I'm here? I can build tents for Elijah and, and Moses and you. And No. And then this was after the resurrection in John 21. This was after Peter denied the Lord. And, and we, we know that Peter was totally humiliated by that. Just felt horrible. And Jesus came to him and he, he, he made a special visit to Peter. That says a lot about Peter. You know, we, we, we pick on Peter a lot, but, but Jesus saw something in Peter that a lot of other people couldn't see. They, they couldn't see his heart. They couldn't see what a great man that Peter was and that what he was becoming. And when Jesus spoke to him in John 21, he asked him, he said, Peter, do you love me? And, and really, you miss a lot in the English version because there's two Greek words used for love in this passage. Jesus asked Peter, do you agape me? Do you love me unconditionally above all else? That God love. And Peter responds, I phileo you. That's, you know I'm your friend. And Jesus asks him a second time, he says, Peter, do you agape me? Lord, you know I phileo you. I'm your friend. And a third time he asks him, and he says the same thing, I'm your friend. And each time Jesus says, okay, well, if you're my friend, feed my sheep, feed my lambs. The second time, okay, if you're, you're my friend, take care of my flock. Okay, if you're my friend, feed my sheep. You see, Peter came to really understand how important the success of God's kingdom was to Jesus. This was more important to him than anything, that he was about to hand the torch to Peter and the other apostles. And they were the ones who were going to carry this on until today. That's the background of Peter appealing to these elders. He says that I'm a witness of the sufferings of Christ. Peter had been by Jesus' side during the entire ministry. He had witnessed firsthand all the times Jesus was humiliated. How Jesus would humble himself to serve others. How he was ridiculed and mocked and belittled and opposed on every turn. 
and yet respond it with mercy and forgiveness and kindness and goodness. Peter witnessed all that. He saw it all. He was there when Jesus was teaching about humility. When the disciples came to him and said, who's the greatest in the kingdom? And all of them wanted one of those secretary positions on his cabinet. And Jesus said, unless you become like this little child, you will not even enter the kingdom of heaven. Unless you humble yourself like this child, you will not become anything in the kingdom. Peter learned all this right from Jesus. And Peter witnessed the arrest of Jesus, the mock trial. And remember, Peter followed at a distance. You remember this story, right? How he, he was out by the fire with, with some others and a servant girl came up to him and said, oh, you're one of his disciples. And no, I'm not. And I think Luke's account is the only account that, that says that when Peter denied him for the third time, that Jesus looked through a window and made eye contact with Peter. And he went away and wept bitterly. Peter saw all that. Peter saw Jesus marched up to the cross, nailed to it, and hung up there to die. He watched the people from a distance walk by and spit on him and mock him. He saw the soldier thrust the spear through his side. He witnessed all of this. And he was there when Jesus rose from the dead and Jesus went and showed himself to Peter. And that radically changed his life forever. And so he comes appealing to this church, to these elders in particular, saying, if the Son of God did this for us, what are we willing to do for him? That's, that's what he's saying to them. And he calls them to clothe themselves with humility. You see, humility is so essential to the Christian life. You can't be a Christian without humility. It's impossible. You must become like that little child. Humility is the foundation for all the good things that Christians do. And we're going to see that in this text. And so, I appeal to you as a fellow elder. That's his plea. Just, I'm just one of you. I know what you're going through. I've gone through the same stuff. And I've seen firsthand what Jesus did for us. And so I'm appealing to you. Elders, he says, you need to shepherd God's flock. Be humble. Serving as overseers. In other words, you are like a shepherd who watches over the sheep. You know, when we've studied the 23rd Psalm where David talks about the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And he goes on to talk about how, how the good shepherd takes care of all of his needs, leads him to quiet waters and besides still streams. And, and David was a shepherd. David knew what it was like to sit out there under the stars and, and gather all the sheep together and protect them. And if a wolf came, he would get a staff and go out and fight him off. David even said that he killed a lion and a bear defending them. David knew what it was like to lead them over to green pastures and still waters. He knew, he knew what it was like to look for these, these new places for his sheep to graze because he loved them and he, he wanted them to, to do well. He's saying, elders, have that same love for your church. That's what he's saying. 
as an overseer, look at your church. Look, we're hurting right now. Look at our attendance. What can I do to help this church be strengthened and be all that God wants us to be? That's the job of the elder. That's the humility of an elder. And notice he, he, he mentions not because you must. And this is an important point. Everything about Christianity is voluntary. If it was run like a business, we'd all be fired. Right? we find somebody that was better in the, doing what you do. But that's, it's not run like a business. It's run like a family. And, and caring for people like brothers and sisters, like children. Not because you have to, because you don't have to. You don't even have to be here this morning. You can leave right now if you want. Nobody's going to force you to listen to this, right? And nobody's going to follow you home and make sure that you do what I'm saying right here. It's all voluntary. Not because you must, but because you are willing. Because you are willing. And I think about uh, this verse in 1 Timothy 3.1. He says, here is a trustworthy saying. Whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task. It is one noble task. Church, you should appreciate your elders. They look out for you. They love you. They want the best for you. Not because you must, but because you're willing as God would want you to. You do it because you love Jesus. Not greedy for money, but eager to serve. There are, believe it or not, there are elders and preachers and pastors who are greedy for money. I mean, they do, they do this to harvest money from people. A lot of these televangelists, and I'm not the judge of them, so I don't know what's in their hearts, but, but from my perspective, it doesn't look good when they're flying around their own private jets and they own multiple multi-million dollar homes all over the, the world and they stay in you know, the, the most expensive hotel resorts when they do a conference. and That doesn't sound to me like Jesus' plan. Elders are not to be greedy for money, but eager to serve. It's a humble position. <laughs> you don't get paid for it. In Titus 2.14, it says, Jesus Christ, who gave himself to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Chapter 1, verses 7 and 8, Since an overseer manages God's household, he must be blameless, not overbearing, but quick, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. Rather, he must be hospitable. One who loves what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. And disciplined. Eager to serve. You know, looking for areas to serve and where, where I can help this church to be better. Where, where, where can I help? Not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. In other words, when the church watches you, what do they see? Do they see that devoted, 
person to God that, that wants the best for God's kingdom, wants the best for his church. That's, that's the idea behind all this. And then he addresses the younger. Most of us are older, but <laughs> there's some younger here. The younger are to humbly submit to their elders. This is important. Voluntarily place themselves under the supervision of the elders. You know something that's really common among younger people? They make really bad choices. They, they, they do foolish things. And you know, when you get older and you look back on your life, you always think, if I'd just done what mom told me to do. You know, she told me not to hang out with that guy, but I hung out with him, and look where I am now. And there's something to older people that they, they've got experience under their belt. They have wisdom. Not all of them. Some of them are... You know. But the elders of the church are chosen by you because you see that wisdom in them. You, you, you trust them. You know that, that they are good people, that they have good hearts, they love the Lord, and that they want to do God's will. And so that's how they're selected. And so placing yourself under their supervision means that like when they come to you and they say, listen, you know, I want to help you to grow in your faith. I've noticed you haven't been here on Wednesday nights for Bible study. You know, this, this would be a good opportunity to plug in and get some good biblical teaching during that time. And, and the idea behind this is that you, as a younger person, you hear that advice and you say, you know what? I'm going to do that. I'm just going to, I'm going to set that time aside and I'm going to be there. Or I've, I've noticed that you haven't been to church in a while. I want to encourage you to be faithful and regular in your attendance. It's important for your spiritual growth. It's not required you know, stuff that you have to do to go to heaven. That's not what we're talking about. But it will help you to be a spiritual person. It will keep you focused on God. And so you younger people, place yourself under that supervision. Seek advice and wisdom from your elders and follow their teachings, follow their guidance. Uh, these, these passages in Hebrews chapter 13. Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider their outcome. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. You, you see, I mean, I, I'm going to pick on Willie for a minute. You see Willie's mom in Willie. Willie. That disciplined, God-fearing woman trained Willie to be the God-fearing man of God that he is today. Right? He listened to his mom. And the same is true in the family of God, that when we listen to our elders, when we listen to their advice and guidance and we give ourselves to that. We voluntarily, again, you're not going to get forced to do this, but we choose to obey them, to follow what they're asking us to do. When we do that, it's for our good. It helps us spiritually, helps us to grow. In 13.7, it says, have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this, listen to this, do this so that their work will be a joy, not a burden. 
for that would be of no benefit to you. Do this so that their work will be a joy, not a burden. How would it be a burden? Well, if you just dismissed everything that they said and all the encouragement that they were giving you and the direction that they were trying to lead you in and everything, uh, you know, those of you that are parents, you know that's not fun. It kind of robs the joy when your your kids don't listen to you and they do things that you know you 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 wish they wouldn't. And the goal of younger people is to make our leaders work a joy. In other words, I see this. I see God's hand in this. I see God working in your life. I see him bringing about this change in you. And, and, and that is so uplifting to me. That is so awesome. Or it could be, man, I'm so fearful that so-and-so is, I don't know. It's like they're just teetering on the edge. I don't know if they're going to survive. Humility. See, that's, that's at the foundation of this. Humility. And then he turns to the rest of the church and he says, for all Christians to show humility toward one another. This doctrine is taught consistently in all the epistles. Philippians 2, Paul wrote to the church there in verses 3 and 4, and he said, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in lowliness of mind or in humility. Consider others better than yourselves. Each of you not looking to your own good, but also to the good of others. And really, you know, humility is that, it's defined as lowliness of mind. In other words, not, not thinking more of yourself than you ought to. That somehow you're, you're more important than everybody else. And it, it says there, it says, you know, that you should consider others better than yourself. Imagine a church where every member came to church and look for ways to encourage one another. That's what the church is supposed to do. Right? He, he actually tells us in, in Hebrews 10, 24, 25, he says, let us consider one another how we might provoke one another unto love and good deeds, not forsaking our assembling together as the custom of some is, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. We come with the mindset, I'm going to encourage you. I know that so-and-so is going through these hard times in their life. I'm going to encourage them this morning. I'm going to let them know that I, I'm praying for them. And, and, you know, Blake was here this morning. He, he goes to another church for worship service, but he's here for Bible study. Blake texted me a couple weeks ago and asked me for prayers because he got fired at his job uh, working for this big guitar company in San Diego and he was discouraged and you know I, I told him Blake I'm praying for you and if there's anything I can do for you if you need help let me know I'm, I'm ready to help you and he texted me back and was just so appreciative that I would say that to him he was here this morning, and he got another job. A better job. <laughs> and he was so thrilled that God had answered our prayers. And that, you know, it, that's how churches should function. That's how, that's how we build relationships that last and, and help each other to be faithful and to grow being there for each other. Willing to occupy any station, however humble, by which we might serve others and honor God. And I've mentioned this before, you know. Uh, some church members, 
may feel like they're above cleaning the building or pulling weeds or something. And I'm not suggesting that elderly people go out there and do that. Please don't. But what I'm saying is, if it's because of a job that seems below you, you have the wrong attitude. Because you remember what Jesus did to Peter? <laughs> you remember that? Where they were at the house for a meal and nobody washed the feet. And then Jesus got out, grabbed a pan of water and a towel and bent down to start washing feet. You remember how humiliated Peter was by that? No way, Lord, you're not washing my feet. Jesus, oh, yes, I am. Okay, then wash my whole body. <laughs> Whatever you want. <laughs> now, you don't need that, but you definitely need this lesson. And he washed all their feet, and then he asked them, do you know what I just did? If I, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. There is no station, no job too low for God's people to serve in. If, if the kingdom would do better if you did it, It. If it'll help God's cause in any way, do it. Just do it. Humble yourself. Do it. And again, humbly submitting to one another is taught consistently in the in the epistles and in Ephesians five twenty one. He says, "Out of reverence for Christ." Why do you do it? Out of guilt? No. Out of, you know, harassment from Jim? No. For brownie buttons? No. Why do you do it? Because of your deep respect and love for Jesus. That's it. Because you want to honor him. You want to please him. So I'm willing to do Whatever, whatever's needed. And then he gives this incentive for humility. And this is a pretty strong one. Because God opposes the proud. You know that word in the Greek literally means goes to battle against. This is an, an aggressive word. It's not saying that God just sits back and says, okay, that was bad. I'm not going to help you. This says he goes to battle against it. In other words, when, when you are proud, when you're arrogant, you are God's enemy. <laughs> that's, that's scary to think about. Do you remember when Peter and John were arrested and they were brought before the Sanhedrin and the Sanhedrin wanted to put them to death? You can go back and read Acts 5. Sanhedrin said, let's put these guys to death. They're causing all kinds of trouble in the city. Let's just stop it right here. And then Gamaliel stands up and says, wait a minute, let me, let me talk to you guys. Think, think this through. And he says, you know, if, if these guys don't have God's favor on their side, they're just going to fizzle out, be gone in no time. But if this is the hand of God, you better be careful because you're going to find yourself fighting against God. And that's a losing battle. You don't win those. So think this through. God opposes the proud. Who are the proud? They're the self-centered. And that's our culture today, isn't it? Me, 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 me. It's all about me. Self-righteous. 
I'm better than them. Self-willed? Hey, nobody tells me what to do. Self-reliant? I don't need you guys. I can do fine on my own. They refuse to submit either to God or man. That's what proud is. Even though they know God's will for them, they refuse to submit to it. Even though God gave them leaders to guide them and, and direct them in all holiness and, and to grow in their faith, they ignore them. They refuse to obey their leaders. That's pride. That's pride. And, and he's saying, listen, you don't want to get on the wrong side of God. Sooner or later, God will humble the proud. You, you can count on it. We see it sometimes, right? We see arrogant people be humbled. And we see it a lot in politics, but but if you think back through the stories of the Old Testament, you know, you think about even Moses. When Moses got proud, remember when he struck the rock? He said, oh, if I got to give you water to drink. God said, uh, 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 uh. That's not the attitude I want you to lead. And Moses was forbidden to go into the promised land because of that. You remember Nebuchadnezzar? <laughs> and how he was trying to get Daniel and Meshach, the, all the shacks, to go to church with him. <laughs> and, and tried to force him, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, no way, we're not doing it. Absolutely not. And he was going to have them killed. You remember what happened to Nebuchadnezzar? He ended up eating grass like a cow. Losing his mind. God humbled him. Remember David and Goliath? Remember Goliath out there saying, send out your best soldier. See if he can take me. And this little shepherd boy comes on the scene and says, who is this uncircumcised nutcase? Give me my sling. <laughs> And he went out there and he dropped him. You see this over and over again. God humbles the proud. And if he doesn't do it now, he'll do it later. But you don't want to be on that side. And he gives grace to the humble. And this is so, such a great incentive. He gives grace to the humble. He gives his favor, his unmerited favor to the humble. Not because they deserve it, not because he owes it to them, but because they're humble. That's all. Because they're humble. And we're talking about all kinds of grace. You know, I was thinking about John 10.10. 10. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that you might have life and have it to the full. I'm living life to the full now. Because of Jesus, because of his ways, because of his instruction in my life. I'm able to have a good marriage, to hold a good job, to be a part of a great church, to, to enjoy life to the full. I'm, I'm a nature enthusiast, man. I love hiking. I love climbing mountains. I love all that stuff. Just God has blessed my life. Three beautiful sons. God just filled my life with joy and peace. No, it's, it's not all been easy, and you guys know. Losing a son in the last couple of years was hard, really hard. 
but I trust God and I, I trust that, that he is working out his will in my life and I yield myself to him. And I continue to have joy in my life and to be at peace in my life in spite of the difficult times in my life. I've given my life to Jesus. Jesus said, Matthew 11, 28 through 30, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. I will give you rest. And he does. This is all God's grace. This is what he offers to us. But it doesn't stop there. It's the riches of God's grace that Jesus purchased with his sacrifice. Ephesians 1, 3 through 10. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ for he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. He, in his love he predestined us for adoption and sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. God's grace, his spiritual gifts, are tremendous. And all of this should inspire and motivate and cause us to want to humble ourselves before God under his mighty hand and be led by him in work. And if that's not incentive enough, you're wasting your time here. If you think you'd be a happier person out there getting drunk right now or, you know, whatever, I think you're mistaken. And then he closes with the rewards of humility. He says, God will exalt the humble in due time. And I think that due time is important in this text. I acknowledge your suffering. I, I understand what you're going through. I, I'm suffering too. That's what he's writing to these guys saying, I'm just like you. But when the Lord is ready, he is going to exalt us. We are going to be lifted up. We are not going to have to suffer forever. And so continue in your faith. Be faithful. Be humble in service to God's kingdom. We're told that if we're faithful to the end, that we will be welcomed into the eternal kingdom of Jesus. You know, I love Matthew 25. I preach this a lot of times during Orphan Sunday about I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty. You gave me drink. Sick, you visited me. But it starts out saying, enter in. Enter in to the inheritance that has been prepared for you. Welcome, good and faithful servant. It's time to enjoy your reward. It says that they will receive the crown of glory. And I think about how, you know, in Romans chapter 8, for example, he says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed to us. That that when we get to heaven, we're going to look back on all these things that we suffered through in this life, the sacrifices that we made, the great opportunities that we passed up for the kingdom of God. And we're going to say, you know what? It was way worth it. It was way, way worth it. I'm so glad I became a follower of Jesus. And then verse 7, listen friends, cast all your cares on him 
because he cares for you. I know you're struggling. I know, I know life is difficult. Cast your anxieties on him. In Hebrews 4, he tells us that, that we have a high priest who is un, who's not unable, I'm sorry, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Look, wherever you're at in life this morning, whatever your worries are, whatever your, your trials are, sufferings, whatever it is, we have a, a Savior in heaven who empathizes with us. He's been through this. He knows how hard it is. And he wants to help you. He wants to give you the help you need to get through this. And he's always there. He's always there in, in uh, Hebrews Hebrews 13. I won't close with this passage. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Remember your leaders who speak the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus is the same yesterday and today and forever. He never changes. His word never changes. I know that since COVID, life has been chaotic. I mean, it, it, it had a, a tremendous impact on our church, lost several members to death. A lot of people fled California. <laughs> a lot of our members moved to, to other states. And it's been rough. And it's been rough. And to be honest with you, it's a struggle for me to keep saying and hearing, we're kind of slim this morning. You know, we, we look at all the empty seats. I, I, I want us to grow again. I, I want us to all have that same deep conviction of Peter. That humble submission that he had. That he learned from Jesus. I want us all to have that in our own lives. That we all might work together to make this church a flourishing church again. And so I appeal to you as, as one who is one of you who is going through the same things that you go through. Let us clothe ourselves with humility and wrap a towel around our waist and let us serve the Lord with great zeal and, and joy to build this church up again. We're going to sing a song in closing this morning, hark the gentle voice of Jesus, follow. Let's all be standing with me.